Welcome back to another episode of the Mac Rumor Show. I'm so excited. Mark, you were like one of our first guests, and it's been so long, like a full calendar year. And so Mark Ehrman, everybody, the, the, the famous Mark Ehrman, he's back. Uh, we can talk about all of the rumors and have the man, the myth, the legend himself comment on everything. What's going Fam- on, man? Famous not so much, but I'm, uh, I'm glad to be here, I, I guess. It's been one year since last time. Uh, I'll see you again in a year after this, or maybe sooner. I don't know, I would, but I'm let's, very let's, happy let's, to be here. I want to talk to you more. Let's make it sooner than than one year. But, <laughs> I mean, you're probably one of the only guests that I don't need to really like go through the list of everything. Everybody knows who you are, so you're good. But we do have a ton of stuff to get into, um, so we're just going to jump right into it. Uh, there's a lot going on in, in June, early June, as you might know, WWDC. Um, and this is finally the year where I am hoping that a lot of like platforms get the major boost uh you know the the redesigns and the new features and stuff and so we'll start with w uh we'll start with uh the apple watch um watch os 10 uh you recently reported that there's some going to be some notable changes one of the biggest updates since what like forever hasn't the apple watch looked the same for forever (laughs) yeah i think this is going to be the biggest software update uh to the apple watch since the first version came out you know they've made pretty iterative changes over the years. They've added a lot of new health and fitness functionality. Uh, They've really refocused around complications on the watch face, uh, notifications. They downgraded or removed things that were in the OS at the beginning. Remember glances, they got rid of those. Uh, They've, you know, demoted things that were really core parts of the initial watch. Sort of remember when you clicked the button on the side, it showed you your friends list, right? In that circle. And then you can quickly message them, send them your heartbeat and whatnot. Uh, They've demoted that too. Uh, But this time we're likely to see some pretty big interface changes. So do you think that will be uh, with regards to a sort of basic interaction with the device? Are we talking about maybe the home screen or is how far is this sort of a a way of reconsidering basic ways of actually interacting with the watch, I guess would be my question. Yeah, I think that this will reconsider uh, basic ways of interacting with the watch. I do think you're going to see notable user interface updates across the system. Uh, I've got more coming on this. And so, you know, look out for uh, my article on this as well. But, you know, to date, you know, what I've said is that this is going to be a pretty big update. Uh, I'm not sure I would compare it to the transition from iOS 6 to iOS 7 in 2013. Uh, That was a pretty core uh, revamp to the system end to end in terms of user interface design. Uh, I don't think the core design is going to change, but I think you're going to see uh, many different ways of using the system and, and new types of uh, interactions. Uh, I've seen some rumors following what I put out there about what that would entail. Um, I, I, you know, I'm not sure about that. I don't think folders would make much sense on the Apple Watch. I was Apple just about Watch, to ask you about that. I guess. Yeah, I guess anything is possible. I haven't heard one way or another. Okay. Um, but certainly, I'm looking forward to a revamp to Watch OS, especially on the Apple Watch Ultra. It felt like they put that bigger screen in, they put that bigger hardware in, but they really didn't revamp the watch faces uh, or the user interface to really match that new design, that bigger display, the more room you have to work with. And traditionally, what we've seen from Apple is that the software is always like a year behind the hardware, right? We've seen this before. Uh, And so I think that this is going to be, you know, the year hopefully where the Apple Watch software catches up uh, with the Apple Watch hardware. Now, the other thing to note is traditionally in very, very strong hardware years for a particular product, you may see a light software year. And in very light hardware years, you see a very strong software update. And this is going to probably be uh, the lightest year in terms of new Apple Watch hardware to date. Uh, Last year was, you know, fairly significant with the Apple Watch Ultra. They went pretty light with the Series 8, uh, and then obviously the new SE was more of a uh, production change in order to get the cost down uh, for both Apple and the consumer, right? They had that updated back that's cheaper to make uh, than the glass uh, back they used previous. Uh, so I think that's how it's going to play out this year, where the big Apple Watch news for the year is probably going to be on the software side, and anything we see on the hardware side is going to be more uh, spec bump, S update, so to speak. So do you get the impression that watchOS is kind of going to steal the show uh, in terms of software updates at WWDC? Well, steal the show, um, if you're comparing watchOS to to iOS and iPadOS uh, and macOS, I think, yes, certainly watchOS is going to be the most significant uh, software update for existing platforms. But I think the the show stealer is going to be 
uh, XROS and the reality headset, as well as the 15 inch air, right? I think those are going to be the main things. And I think that's what they're going to spend the most amount of time on, uh, certainly. Uh, so I wouldn't say it's going to steal the show, but if you're talking about self updates to existing products, I would say sh- sure. We'll get into those in a little bit. That's for sure. Um, but with watch OS, Hartley, did you have anything else before we moved on? Because, you know, he kind of allured to watch OS being the biggest thing, but there is iOS 17, which was also apparently going to get some pretty big changes too. most requested user. Fe- can you, can you explain what that might be a little bit more? The highly requested yeah. features. Sure. So when Apple set out to develop iOS 17, or I should say, you know, they work over, they work over time over a number of years on several different features and enhancements. And they look, you know, every year prior to the year of the new release, what features are ready to go? What features do we want to implement for this particular cycle? Right. And so when they started off on the iOS 17 development cycle last year, the idea was that we're going to go for sort of a polish update. We're going to go at people like to compare these types of things to Snow Leopard, right? A fit and finish update, an underlying performance update, having minimal changes. Now, why did they want to do that? One, a lot of the resources were going towards XROS, but more importantly is that iOS 16, as you guys have written about many times, has faced delay after delay after delay for particular new features. Right. You've seen the Apple Pay Later implementation get delayed. Uh, you've seen various features from 16.0 get pushed back. Uh, Freeform, I believe, was was one of them. You also saw delays to iPadOS because of Stage Manager. Right. iPadOS for the first time ever launched in October instead of September alongside iOS 16. So they uh, they broke that into two separate release paths. Right. And so there were so many delays there and so many functional issues with iOS 16. Uh, they felt that taking a step back would make sense this time around. Uh, but that plan changed, right, at the end of last year. Now they've been go, going full throttle on your standard array of uh, updates, right, a 100, 200 new feature standard iOS update. I'm not expecting anything revolutionary. I'm not expecting a, a redesign. Uh, there are changes coming across the system. I, I certainly know what some of those changes are, and I'll be writing about those soon. Uh, but certainly, I think it's going to be quite a significant update. It's not going to be as significant as the hardware changes this year. Obviously, the iPhone 15 Pro with the titanium back and some of the enhancements there is going to be quite significant. Uh, but I think they are bringing enough new to the table that it's going to be a pretty interesting update. Uh, I would probably compare it mostly to the update, I think it was iOS 15 two years ago, where it seemed like they added new features to every core app, but they didn't do anything like over the top uh, revolutionary, right? I don't think there's going to be a big standout new feature this year, like we saw with iOS 14 with widgets, or we saw with iOS 16 with the lock screen. Uh, I think it's going to be core updates around the system. So one change that you talked about uh, quite a bit with regards to iOS 17 is side loading, um, which is something that definitely has captured a lot of interest with regards to iOS 17. So. I wondered if you could give us a bit of an impression of how you think Apple will handle that, whether it will be uh, a front and center feature or whether it's just going to be sort of pushed out uh, in the side and not be part of the keynote, or will it be a a Europe-only feature? So first of all, I think it will be a Europe-only feature. I think that they're not going to shoot themselves in the foot and expand this globally if they don't have to. I think they're going to play it uh, similarly to how they've played some of the other changes they made to the app store for legal reasons. If you remember, there was that change in the Netherlands uh, around dating apps and the percentage there. And so you have to install a special profile. You have to go through some sort of hoops to do it. And it was very under the radar. Uh, So I think they're going to push more in that direction. I would be a bit surprised if they uh, announced it at WWDC and made this a highlight consumer feature. I think they want to sort of downplay it as much as possible. Uh, At the same time, Uh, I think that this has been a major undertaking inside the company. This has been a exhaustive project uh, across the board, across several divisions, across uh, services, across software engineering, across many departments at Apple Legal, uh, marketing, the App Store department, certainly. And, you know, for that reason, it's possible that they want to get the recognition for it. But at the same time, I don't know why they would, because this is just going to cost them money. my expectation at the same time is while it's going to cost them money, they're going to charge developers uh, to be part of this p- program. And I, had, I would assume they would call it some sort of special program that you would have to apply for a profile, you would have to pay for a profile, and there'll be some sort of review process, even though these apps would be installed outside of the App Store. Uh, I think Apple is going to 
you know, go through the European regulations. This is the Digital Markets Act, as it's called. Uh, and they're going to really stick to, you know, letter of the law here. They're not going to do anything extraneous that would further hurt uh, their grip on the App Store. And quite frankly, why should they? Right. If you're thinking about the situation from their shoes, uh, they're going to just toe the line of what exactly is necessary and not do anything more to disrupt their existing infrastructure. Do you foresee the U.S. ever kind of following suit and being in, in, in kind of the same way, like making them enable that now that they know that Apple will do it and can do it? Yeah, well, the U.S. is certainly trying. Uh, yeah. They've they've done a, actually two bills at this point. They've never, you know, made it to, uh, you know, actual law. They've never been signed into law. Uh, you know, it's interesting that you bring that up, Dan, about how if they're able to implement it for Europe, it seems pretty simple to implement it for other geos. And so I think maybe the fact that they're going to do this, it's going to set a precedent there. And maybe it'll drum up more bills that uh, U.S. government officials will try to push into law. And so we'll see. I don't think anything like that is imminent. Uh, but what you've seen with this USB-C situation is that this started off in Europe, but you have other countries that are pushing for it now. I even saw the state of California is pushing for it too. And obviously the USB-C is a hardware feature and it would be next to, well, I wouldn't say it would be impossible, but it would probably be irresponsible from a manufacturing and marketing yeah. and development perspective to sort of split the iPhone into the USB-C and Lightning models. So they're going all USB-C. I think personally... Uh, Europe, the, their implementation and their rationale uh, for pushing towards USB-C is probably not correct. Uh, but from a consumer standpoint, I think a move from Lightning to USB-C is very consumer friendly. Uh, and I think it is a major improvement given they're already USB-C on everything else, right? And so you'll see USB-C iPhone 15, you'll see USB-C uh, AirPods case. Uh, and I think they've, that those are the only two holes left. There's the USB-C uh, transition that needs to take place in some of the Mac accessories as well. But I think over time, Lightning will probably be phased out. MagSafe Charger Duo or whatever is still Lightning. I just used one like five minutes right. ago before this. So <laughs> that's the only reason why I remember <clears throat> that. That MagSafe Duo is both underrated and overpriced. Yes. Like I like you, the Duo. I, use I like it a lot too, but I don't know that I'd want to yeah. pay for it as much as it is either. <laughs> Well, you know, it was sort of like, okay, they announced it at the event in September 2020. Oh, my God, I need to get my hands on it. And then they release it like three months later. Of course, you're going to just buy it, right? You're yep. not going to return it. The one thing about that white material they use, it's like mine's like yellow at this point. Uh, right? yeah. And it's not like I've taken it through the mud or anything. Apple needs to stop using that material. And if you're going to keep using that material, as much as I love the way the white looks, you got to stop using white. Uh, because my my iPad Pro uh, Magic Keyboard is horrendous, uh, and so it's just they got to stop using that material. I I cannot stand it. But I am, I'm debating whether I get the white Magic Keyboard or the black <laughs> Magic Keyboard next time I get an iPad. I have the black Magic Keyboard. That thing's a disaster too. I've had it since really? 2020, and it's sort of like tearing at the seams a little bit. Uh, and the keys are all there's too much dust and dirt under them. But like you said, Hartley loves for another, Hartley loves for color time. options. Hartley, what are you thinking about the... Uh, well, I actually think that the the white one uh, ages a lot better than the black one. Mm. I think the black what? shows grease and, <laughs> and fingerprints way more than the white one. That's but right. It's just That's right. It's terrible. Way, See, uh, even the AirPods Max smart case is a particularly bad one. Um, See, I'm yeah, getting markings from like used. other things in my bag. Like when I put them in my bag with something else, it's like leaving black scuff marks and stuff. I think whatever it's color you It's pick your poison, get. right? Do you yeah. want it to get dirty or do you want it to get greasy? Right? Yeah, so, that's yeah. true. Well, speaking of getting greasy, can you give us any <laughs> information on w one little breadcrumb of a new feature? Something. Even if you're like, I, I don't have any concrete, but I'm, I'm, I'm feeling confident in my own opinion that this is going to be uh, you know, an iOS 17 feature. We've heard things about the lock, or not the lock screen, the uh, control center. Do you know anything about that that you'd want to be able cheeky, to? cheeky, Dan. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying to get something. <laughs> I haven't heard anything about the, the control center, or I have nothing to share, I should say, about the control center at this part. But I think you'll see changes in uh, Wallet. Okay. I think you'll see changes in uh, Find My. And I think you'll see a bigger push on you know location and, and Find My related things in addition to uh, Wallet and such, some user interface tweaks and enhancements there. Um, there's other stuff too, though. I'll let you know. Go, ah. Interesting. 
I mean, if you, you know, at any point in time, if you're like, okay, I'll give you one breadcrumb of, of, of Mac Rumors exclusive here, you just let us know. Like, interrupt by all means. <laughs> Hey, I work. I work for Bloomberg, not Mac Rumors. So no, 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 no. <laughs> I we understand. We understand. We understand. But uh, no, I appreciate. It, though. Yeah. Um. So the other update that I really wanted to ask you about, Mark, <clears throat> was Mac OS because it's definitely in terms of the the sort of wider. Uh, sort of number of reports and rumors that we look at, it has been the quietest thing, maybe other than tvOS. We've heard absolutely nothing really about what to expect from macOS next year. And it feels like macOS has been really quite iterative and quiet for quite some years at this point. I know Big Sur was a redesign, but functionally there wasn't much going on with it. And the same with Ventura. So uh, can you give us an impression of what to expect from the scale of this year's macOS update? Yeah, I don't think macOS is going to be anything groundbreaking or significant. Certainly, I haven't heard anything uh, remarkable about macOS. I think that they've basically moved to an idea where they're making the enhancements on iOS, uh, iPadOS, watchOS, and elsewhere. And then they bake in support for those features, right, and connectivity to those features uh, in macOS. I think a good example of that last year was the Stage Manager. Uh, built for iPadOS, and then they had to sort of uh, make a, a version of it for macOS as well, uh, because how can you introduce an enhanced, albeit not great, multitasking system that maybe some consider superior on the iPad platform, but not bring it to the Mac, right? Uh, support for things that they add in messages on iPadOS and iOS, they have to do it on macOS as well. So I think you're going to see more of the same uh, in, in macOS this year. So anything they add on iOS, they'll replicate for macOS. You know, what always fascinates me about these uh, OS updates are the naming conventions, right? And traditionally, uh, when they pick a city and then the follow-up version, or pick a part of California, and the follow-up version uh, is pretty close to that original area if it's a minor update, right? They've done this in the past. Uh, there was El Capitan. And so El Capitan, right, is located uh, very closely to Yosemite, geographically, right? So that made sense given El Capitan was a minor update. Um, so Ventura, right, that is actually in Southern California. It's an absolutely beautiful area, beaches, mountains, places to hike. It's, it's awesome. Uh, but there's one famous place in LA uh, that Apple has not named an OS after yet. And if Apple were to go in that direction again of a minor update and they pick the closest city, uh, it would be Malibu, Mac OS Malibu. Now, I haven't heard anything about that, but right. if I was thinking like Apple's marketers, I would call it Mac OS Malibu if it was a minor iterative update over Mac OS Ventura, uh, given the history there of naming conventions. We better get a That's beachy wallpaper with that one. Oh, yeah. Oh, what kind? <laughs> a beachy wallpaper. Oh, beach. Yeah. That would be nice. That would be nice. Um, all right. So before we move on to the hardware side of WWDC, um, we didn't really talk about iPad OS. I'm guessing you're kind of expecting to just adopt some of the iOS 17 features that will come through. But is there any chance in maybe this year? maybe next year that we'll ever see these pro apps that people have been clamoring for, like Logic and Final Cut Pro making its way. I mean, they let DaVinci be the star of the show when the iPad Pro come out, uh, came out uh, with the M2. I'm so shocked by that because it's not like Apple doesn't have its own suite of apps that they could use for this. And I'm just wondering if you have any, any info on that or any thoughts. I mean, it seems clear to me that Apple, I won't say has abandoned, right? But they've pushed a little bit away from those pro apps, right? I know there were rumors that were completely made up a few years ago about Final Cut and Logic and such uh, coming to the iPad. I certainly haven't heard anything about that. Um, I'm seeing less and less work being done on those pro apps at this point. I know there has been a sizable amount of people who've been actually leaving uh, those teams. The head of marketing, uh, Xander Soren, left at the end of last year. Uh, he was involved in those creative apps as well. So, you know, maybe they're taking some time to to do some sort of rethink, right? It's been about a decade since the big Final Cut Pro X uh, rethink. So maybe it's time for another one of those and maybe they're hard at work at that. And obviously, if they're going to do a full revamp to Final Cut Pro, uh, 
that would probably have the iPad and even the Apple headset in mind, right? And so I would imagine that would all be a cross-platform thing. I mean, the big push at Apple right now, uh, sort of behind the scenes, is to get every app, every feature to work across all of Apple's devices and integrate across all of Apple's devices, sort of that continuity push. And, you know, the dream scenario is that you own an Apple Watch, an iPhone, a MacBook, an iPad, and an Apple headset, right? Those five devices. And all five of those devices are capable of doing all the same things, just in different use cases and different times of your day. And Apple's push, and this has been uh, pushed by Marzipan or, or Catalyst starting in 2019, uh, with the idea of running iPad apps on the Mac. Now you can run iPhone apps on the Mac and vice versa. So the the core idea is having sort of like one universal binary per app and one main OS that runs on everything that's customized to the specific interface and input paradigm of those devices. So I think that is the big thing from Apple. And I think you'll see them discuss that uh, idea this year. Interesting. I think it will be interesting to see personally whether any future update to those per apps is accompanied by a subscription model as well. No, um, no, Hart Hartley, please, for the love of God, do not say that. <laughs> like right now, I'd be shocked what? if it wasn't. Yeah, I know, I'd be if it wasn't. but right now it's like the best three hundred dollars you could spend if you are a content That's creator, a, a, a student, a of producer. Them. Oh my Great gosh, value. it's uh, yeah. I mean, you could do everything you need to do and not have to pay for Adobe apps. Uh, and so do not bring that up. Uh, I do not want to hear that. <laughs> Dan, on, on Final Cut, that's yeah. what you use, right? Yeah. How often are they doing like bug fixes and software updates and enhancements to that? Not, Rare, as, right? often as, not as often as you would like. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, it seems like there's clearly something going on there. I mean, there, there, lately, I would say over the last two years, there have been some updates um, but they, and, and when they do come, they are bigger updates, but that's because they don't, you know, they don't address them for like six to eight months at a time. And then it's just like, whatever bug you're dealing with, you're dealing with it for a while. So you better learn to work around it. Um, yeah, yeah. hopefully something turns around there soon. Cause I, I'm, I'm getting lots of DMs and emails from people who use those pro apps who are, you know, asking when is there going to be a new version? What's going on with Apple and pro apps? And uh, it feels like when people really started complaining about that about five years ago, Apple promised that wouldn't happen again. So I would be shocked if they really abandoned ship there. Uh, but clearly something's going on around, uh, going on behind the scenes. You know, they're very strapped for resources there. Um, you know, it's a very thin and mean organization and they have to prioritize certain things and things get lost when you're launching a new platform. Right, there's a lot of resources across the company going into XR West and the reality headset. So you know, maybe it has something to do with that too. And obviously, you're seeing a big update to watch and you know everything else they have going on there. So in terms of their revenue-driven priorities, Final Cut's probably pretty low on the totem pole. But I know, I know, I know. I know. <laughs> but 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 the part the point I was going to make is that that's the core core Apple audience that sort of mm -hmm. leads the discussion. So you have to make those people happy. And I think that sort of spreads to everyone around sort of like, uh, you know, the center, the center of a wheel. Right. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of the headset, that is literally the next topic, but you did mention the MacBook air and everyone's expecting a new MacBook air. There's been a ton of topic around a 15 inch MacBook air, which I am super excited about if that's, if that's happening. Uh, but we did also see that it was going to be continuing on with M2. Is that your expectations? The 15 inch will come with M2 and not M3? Yeah. I wrote last week that the 15 inch air would run M2 and everyone else now seems to agree. Um, the M3 is not going to be ready until the end of year. That's a three nanometer design and TSMC is not ready to start popping out three nanometers at the quantity that Apple needs and at the uh, yield rates that Apple needs until later this year. So that 15 inch uh, will be an M2 and I don't think that changes the purchase story. I think people are going to line up for that thing. Uh, maybe not literally, but I think that it's going to be one of the most popular Macs ever. People have been asking for a 15 inch MacBook Air for a number of years. This is actually Apple's third attempt at launching a 15-inch MacBook Air. They were going to do it as a follow-up to uh, the 2010 redesign that never happened. Uh, they considered it in 2011 as part of that. And then they were looking at doing it last year uh, as part of the initial revamped MacBook Air for the Apple Silicon launch. Uh, now they're finally going to do it. 
and I think that's going to be a really hot machine. I think a lot of people are going to like it. It looks just like the current MacBook Air, obviously, just with the wider, bigger display. And I think it's going to be a really exciting product for a lot of people. And obviously, next year, they'll follow up with an M3 version. And later in the year, we'll see probably an M3 version of the 13-inch MacBook Air. Uh, and then at some point, they'll get them on the same uh, chip chip roadmap. So that's really one thing that I was interested in getting your thoughts on there, Mark, is how the M3 plays into this. So obviously at this point in the lineup, a 15 inch model with M2 makes perfect sense because M3 just isn't ready. But if we are going to get M3 chips in Macs by the end of the year, and by then the 13 inch model will have been out for well over a year, will Apple um, split these two machines in terms of chip? Because it would seem odd to have an M3 in the 13 inch, but an M2 in the 15 inch. Um, is this something that they will see as updating together? And if so, will that be updated perhaps on a slightly more delayed time frame going into next year? I'm just trying to get a sense of how this works because the timing is a bit strange. Well, the, the, the issue is that they were wanting to release this M2 15-inch MacBook Air last year, right? And obviously resource strapped with COVID, not only in terms of engineering, but production as well. Uh, so they had to sort of hold their fire on the M2 15-inch MacBook Air. And it's not as simple as swapping out a chip. You can't just swap out the M2 with an M3, right? The architecture of the chips are completely designed from the get-go uh, with the machine themselves. And it's all very integrated on the hardware side, on the software side, on the chip side. So it's not as easy as swapping it out. Mac sales are down considerably. They, they need something, right? So getting that M2 15-inch MacBook Air out, even though it might be a bit outdated on the chip side in six to nine months from now, uh, is probably the right move. People are still going to buy them up. And I don't think it would be, I think it would be odd, certainly, but I don't think it would be the end of the world, uh, obviously, in the context that we're talking about, um, to have an M2 15-inch Air and an M3 uh, 13-inch Air, right? You're still getting that big screen size boost. And then in the following cycle, they'll be able to get them both on the same uh, platform. The other possibility is that they launch the M2 15-inch MacBook Air in June, uh, and then they hold the 13-inch MacBook Air M3 update till spring next year, and they launch uh, the M3 15-inch uh, MacBook Air and M3 13-inch MacBook Air at the same time next spring, and the M2 15-inch Air is on a nine-month cycle. Uh, a nine-month Mac life cycle also wouldn't be unheard of. So I think either way they play this, it's going to be fine. People are still going to buy them up. Maybe even me. I don't know yet. Do it. The MacBook Air is no. the best. The MacBook Air is the best laptop. If you don't need tons and tons of crazy performance, which even if you did, you know, every once in a while, you can still get away with it depending on your configuration. So, highly recommend. Yeah, I've, I've got the M1 Max, uh, 16 oh, well. inch MacBook Pro, because I, I really need. The, <laughs> well, I really need the performance for uh, Twitter and, and video calls and such. So. I I could make an argument that in you might you might actually really need that with the way Twitter's going these days and how many calls I need it and... for Google Chrome. I think well, for sure. Google Chrome, honestly, you might need an M2 Ultra <laughs> with a terabyte of RAM uh, to get Chrome running with more than five or six tabs open at once. Oh, God, I can imagine. I can imagine what your your desk. What do you are you like? How many tabs do you have open at at a, at, a, at any given time? Oh, it depends on the time of day. Um, dozens, hundreds, thousands. How? It just how? depends what I'm working on. <laughs> Your M1 Max must but be on fire. Always. And, you know, I, I, I use my laptop primarily, but I have a desktop as well uh, at my office and my phone and my Apple Watch. I to traditionally leave the iPad at home. There was a time where I was trying to do as much work as I can from the iPad because it was so convenient with the magic keyboard and the, how light it was. And, you know, I had prior to this M1 16 inch, I had the Intel 16 inch and that thing was awful. The battery life was sub two hours. It was always overheating. You could cook an egg on the back if you wanted on a cold day. And so I mostly left that thing at home and used the iPad instead. Uh, but now these Apple Silicon chips are absolutely astonishingly incredible. The battery life, the speed, it doesn't slow down. You rarely have issues with these things. And so, you know, I'm back to the Mac because of those chips. But at one point, it just got so bad with the performance of Intel. And it's so obvious why they had to make this transition. I'm looking forward to it. 
I'm also looking forward to this damn headset. I I, I really want to stop talking. Finally, about right? This. I really need to stop talking about this headset. At least the 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 speculation of it. I just want to see it. I can't believe it. I have been writing about this thing since 2016 or 2017, and it's already 2023. There <laughs> has been no Apple product that has taken this long, other than the Apple Car. The Apple Car is going to end up being. Let's see. They started in 15. Uh, that's going to be a 15 year product, right? But the headset's yeah. pretty damn close. And so I'm excited for the run up. The next two months are going to be exciting. Uh, and I'm excited for this to finally get out the door and I can move on to the next topic. Well, we're going to talk Screw. about it now. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, we're um, not. I mean, the next product. I know, I know. Um, so, I'll right back to the Apple car once WWDC hits. Yes. Um, so the one feature we could talk about so much with this headset, um, there, there really is so much we could go into, but one feature that you've reported on that definitely caught the attention of a lot of our readers was this uh, in-air typing experience. Um, because you didn't make it sound like uh, it was too polished or that it would be something that would be uh, a runaway feature. Um, and I, I believe you said you weren't even sure if it would actually be in the final release version of the headset. So I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about whether this will be like a, a beta feature when it arrives or whether this will be front and center finished in the marketing materials. We're seeing people typing away in the air. Uh, I do think that it will be in the final release. I do think it's gonna be finicky. And I do think most people will wanna pair a Bluetooth keyboard, right? Uh, you also should be able to use your Mac keyboard or an iPhone keyboard, sort of how you can use your iPhone keyboard to type into your Apple Watch or to type into your Apple TV. And so I think it's going to make for a cool demo, but I'm not entirely sure if they're solving problems here with this headset, right? They're creating a new platform and paradigm, but they're not necessarily solving an issue that people have been asking to be solved, right? Uh, I think they've even are going as far as creating new problems for themselves, things like in-air typing, right? And taking people out of the real world is a real concern internally. Uh, but I think the headset is gonna be awesome. It's gonna be straight out of science fiction. I think it's gonna be a status symbol. I think it's gonna be the future of the computer. I think it's gonna be like an iPad for your face. I think the people who get their hands on it are going to love it. Initially, it's going to be sort of the really, really niche, like tech focused crowd, like the four of us or the three of us, right? <laughs> uh, but eventually, you know, this is where the world is going. This is where the industry is going towards mixed reality and virtual reality and augmented reality. Uh, and this is the platform to take Apple in that direction. It's gonna be a very long timeline. Uh, it's going to be extensive. I think you're going to see frequent software updates. I think you're going to see a lot of changes to both the hardware and software over time. Uh, and, and certainly they want to make this a core part of the company. The one issue, not the one issue, but a core issue that they've run into is that I feel like Meta has sort of soiled the market. They've created this false promise of the metaverse and this false, false promise of mixed reality that they really failed on. Right. And so they sort of soiled the public opinion on this type of technology. And so not only does Apple have to sell a new type of technology to people, but they have to sell a new type of technology that people are already uh, critical of. Right. And, and uh, already are skeptical of because of how the market has existed thus far. They haven't had that challenge with prior product lines. Nobody was skeptical about smartphones before the iPhone. Nobody was skeptical about smartwatches. Nobody was skeptical about tablets, right? Those were all markets that it was extremely clear that there's extreme amounts of demand and understanding and desire for. Uh, whereas on the Apple headset, you're not seeing a market desire, you're not seeing demand, you're not seeing excitement, you're not seeing understanding. Uh, so from that perspective, this is an extraordinarily risky launch for Apple. Uh, the good news for them is that they have so much cash and uh, they have enough bandwidth, uh, just enough bandwidth to almost take a risk with this type of product. But I think it's going to play out similarly to the Apple Watch and the iPad, where it's going to start off, you know, a little niche and slow, but over time it's going to explode, right? But let me rephrase that. The iPad exploded pretty much from the get-go, uh, so maybe more so like the Apple Watch. So... 
Speaking about how this device will be targeted, this has been something that has been, we, we've sort of heard the rumors go back and forth on it in terms of uh, it will be really consumer focused, or it might be a little bit more developer focused, or, you know, we've heard odd rumors about there being different prototype headbands specifically for developers and then consumers and all this sort of thing. There's, there's been this tension between how far it is meant for the average user. And obviously the price point there is the big elephant in the room. And one of your latest reports where you uh, shed some light on some of the apps to expect um, from the headset really, to me, did make it seem like this is a much more consumer-focused headset um, than we were initially expecting. So do you get the sense that Apple is going to sort of present this as uh, a tentative first-generation device that is for enthusiasts? Or do you think they are going to just get up there on stage and say, no, this is for everyone. It's got pages. It's got Fitness Plus. It's got meditation. Apple's a very marketing driven company and the first rule of marketing, and I'm not sure they teach you this in marketing classes in business school uh, because it's so obvious is don't limit your market. Don't hold your product back. Don't do anything to intentionally shoot yourself in the foot. I think it would be bizarre and short-sighted for Apple to do anything of the sort to portray this as a beta a developer focused prototype, a device for enthusiasts. I think that would be a huge mistake. Why would Apple do that? Right. And so I think to your point, Hartley, they're going to get on stage and they're going to say, this is for everyone. It has pages. It has iMovie. It has GarageBand. You can game on it. You can uh, work out in it. You can watch movies in it. You can do everything in it. You can do anything in it. And it's the future of the computer and the future of our ecosystem. Uh, I think there's no way that they limit themselves with this device. It would just be a mistake. Why, why, why destroy your market before it even exists? I think that would throw away $10 billion in R and D and, uh, you know, billions more in marketing spend. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. They've never done that before. Yes. Uh. I suppose it's just, they've, they've never, <laughs> they've never brought to market a device at right. this price point um, and sort of a device that at this price point, a lot of people won't really know if it's for them. When they introduced the Pro Display XDR, Apple was able to say, you know, this is a, this is competing with reference monitors that are more right. expensive in spite of its price right. point. So I guess it's that tension right. with the price that- uh, It's the that tension with the price. Sort of, yeah. But I think the Apple perspective is, if we're not gonna drink our own Kool-Aid, why should anyone else drink it? Right. Right. And so I definitely think that in the case of the Apple headset, despite the price, it's going to be portrayed as a product for everyone while internally understanding that it might not be perceived that way and that things are going to start off fairly slow. Right. And there's plenty of people who think this should be positioned as a developer prototype. But from a marketing perspective, that's absolutely a mistake. They're not going to get in the way of their own launch. So, I mean, again, my opinion is maybe that they should. Maybe they should portray it as a developer prototype. Maybe they should hold it back a little bit. Maybe they should portray it as something more for enthusiasts or at the high end of the market. But I don't think they will because I don't think they want to jump in front of their, their own product. Yeah. So, so for those who are enthusiasts, for us three who are most likely going to check it out, <laughs> what would you expect a typical day uh, in the life check of... Check it out. I'm going to be first in line. Well, you know what I, I mean. I don't know about Hartley, but <laughs> maybe, maybe I don't know. I, I, Hartley is I, I much more responsible with his the cash flow. Graphics. I yeah. need to see the uh, the videos. I need to. If they give me Johnny Ives' voice, they get him back for that. You know, I'm Ooh. I'm sold. Whose voice is it going to be? Who is going to do the introduction video? That's my Phil big Schiller. Question. Maybe you know he's still he's still you know on the he's still an Apple fellow. So you know what he would make sense. Tim Cook should do this one. Isn't this kind of like his lasting, like one last stamp on his legacy type deal? Does, isn't the whole rumor that he that wants to get out to get out after this? Shouldn't he be the one to introduce this? I think it's going to be the car, personally. Uh, I oh, don't you think he's going to stick gonna around that long? It. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, look at Bob Iger. He's like going to be CEO of Disney until he's 73 or 75. Tim but there was a point where he wasn't. Even though that was very short-lived. There short -lived. was a point where he was. And, and, yeah. you know, who knows how, how, how long ago that was planned out and what the idea was. Like, I'm listen, I'm going to step away, but if yeah. anything happens, I'm a few miles away. Just give me a call. You have my number, right? Um, 
so yeah, I think the car will probably be Tim's last thing. Uh, as CEO, I would expect him to become chairman after and be involved with Apple for the rest of his life. Uh, but eventually, they will need a new, you know, leader on the ground. Um, I don't know. I mean, the head of the project is Mike Rockwell, right? And he's sort of going to be the face of it, not dissimilar to Kevin Lynch being sort of the early face on the Apple Watch. Um, Dan Riccio oversees Rockwell uh, in terms of headset development. Obviously, Tim is the CEO. Then there's Greg Joswiak, who's head of marketing. So I think that's all possible. Um, You know, the head of design, there is no new head of design at this point, right? All the right. designers just report to the COO, which obviously is odd. So it's not going to be, you know, a designer. So, you know, it'll probably be a mix of people, I think, with Mike Rockwell uh, at the forefront. All right. So when they when they do the video and the, whoever's mythical voice is, is, you know, telling us about this, how do you expect people to use this when they buy it? They get it home, they unbox it. What do you <clears> think is the first thing they're going to do when they spend all day messing around with it? Like, what's going to be the marquee thing? Oof, the marquee thing. Well, I think the FaceTime communications uh, is going to be cool. Now, (laughs) the question is, let's say you buy one. How many people do you know who are also going to have one? Who are you going to be able to to test this with? I honestly, I might be be FaceTiming with you guys, right? That's fine. We haven't videoed in a year, right? And so there'll be that. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot of web browsing on it. I think you're going to want to see people sort of replace their day-to-day. You'll be messaging in it, right? You'll be uh, emailing in it. You'll be doing your documents. You'll be doing your tweets and Twitter and and such in it, right? And so uh, I think it's just going to be a replacement for your day-to-day workflow. I think that's the idea. My concern is the battery life situation, right? If you have to swap out that battery pack that's the size of an iPhone every two hours, how much are they going to charge for battery pack? How many battery packs is it going to come with? And is it going to be annoying to try to swap that thing out every two hours? So I'm interested to see how they play that battery life thing. Uh, when the Apple Watch came out, it launched with, uh, you charge it every night, right? You use it all day. That was the goal. That has not changed except for the Apple Watch Ultra, but that took 10 years. I think once they make a decision on the battery life, they're going to stick to it. And I think instead of trying to eventually move to an internal battery design, they'll maybe try to improve the external battery life pack while adding new features to the device itself. So I would expect the external battery pack situation to last for for many generations of this product uh maybe up until they get the actual glasses rolling i feel like each battery is going to cost like 500 dollars. there's no way that would be crazy i would guess <sighs> i would guess a hundred dollars that would be great if it's a hundred bucks i could see yeah, people buying mu- multiple ones i think it would be worth if you're really using it for that long i mean you probably shouldn't but if you're going to be using it for maybe one other battery makes sense, but two hours is not a long time. I would get, if it were me, obviously it'll come with one. I would get a second one for sure. I don't know who, if people are going to buy four or five of them. That would be ridiculous. <laughs> but the other hope would be maybe over time they have larger battery packs or maybe it comes with a two hour battery pack and then you could buy a jumbo pack that you carry, I, this is a joke, but like you carry in a wagon or your backpack or something, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but this is, it's it's gonna be very powerful with the M2 and that's gonna require a lot of battery life, right? A lot of RAM and uh, it's gonna be pretty high tech and amazing. And I'm looking forward to trying it out, but I am skeptical. I think it's extremely risky. I think it's not gonna appeal to mass consumers. I think it's not solving a problem that people are asking to be solved. I'm not sure it's even solving a problem. Uh, and I think they're going to have a difficult first couple of years with it. And I think they're not even sure of how well this is actually going to go or what people are going to want to use it for. So I'm extremely interested to see how this plays out. And I'm extremely interested to report on how this goes. So just before we let you go, Mark, I have one last question that I am yeah, desperate to sure. ask you, which is okay. Mac Pro. Because this is also another product that we have been hearing about for such a long time, the Apple Silicon Mac Pro. I mean, we were talking about this from what, uh, 2019 was when these discussions really started and we were thinking about the transition to Apple Silicon. Um, But it just seems like the product that's never coming and you've talked a little bit about the conflict with Mac Studio as well. Um, And you've talked a bit about how the Apple dropped this chip, this high-end chip that they had planned for it. So could you give us a little bit of an update on where we are with Mac Pro? Yeah, the Mac Pro, they were originally going to do two 
variations, they were to do an M2 Ultra uh, and an M2 Extreme, as I call it. And the M2 Extreme would double the M2 Ultra's performance. They canceled the M2 Extreme chip because of cost in production. And you were making so few of them anyways, it would cost so much to actually produce them. And is it really worth taking all those resources up to produce something that's going to be so, so niche, even more niche than the M2 Ultra? And the other question is, would people be really willing to even pay for an M2 Extreme, right? And so that's the conflict that existed there. I believe it is still coming this year, right? And I think part of the reason why you're seeing these M that 15-inch MacBook uh, Air being an M2 and then the M3 coming later is because you don't want to launch an M3 before you launch the M2 Ultra chip coming in. Uh, the Mac Pro. And then in terms of the conflict with the Mac Studio, uh, what I believe is we're not going to see a new Mac Studio until the M3 generation at the earliest. So I don't believe there'll be an M2 Ultra Mac Studio. It would not make sense to have an M2 Ultra Mac Studio uh, and an M2 uh, Ultra Mac Pro, just like it wouldn't make sense to have an M1 Ultra uh, Mac Studio and an M1 Ultra Mac Pro. Remember, the Mac Pro was supposed to be an M1 product, and that got pushed back to the M2 generation. I just They brought it up. So once you, once Apple says something about it, they're on the hook now. It's like air power. They did I bring know. it up, but they, <laughs> they said should've... that's for another day. They didn't say uh, if that would be another day in 2022, yeah. 2023, 2024, 2025. They left it vague. Or another day in another universe that's not existing. <laughs> so. But I'm Mark. pretty confident that's coming. So, I mean, you know, it's always possible they pushed it back to the M3 generation, the M3 Ultra, right? We shall see. I Uh, I don't think it's coming in June, though. I don't think it's coming at that point. Oh, that's a shame. I know. I'm bummed. But, hey, we got a lot. We got a lot at WWDC, though. though. I could see We've still got two months to figure out what's coming. So, I'll keep you guys updated. Awesome. Mark, thank you so much. For those who want to be updated, go, you know, subscribe to the Power On newsletter. Follow them on Twitter. Mark, is there anything else that you want to say before we let you go? No, thanks so much, both of you, for having me. You can subscribe to Power On at Bloomberg.com slash Power On uh, on Twitter, Twitter.com slash Mark Gurman. Uh, you can turn notifications on to get my Lakers tweets and any new articles. So I'll and see you And go on Lakers there. except for the both. Cavs. Yes, and thank you both for having <laughs> me. And I do hope to come on uh, sooner. Maybe I come back after the headset comes out. We can talk about impressions and such. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, that would be great. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. 